Hello everyone and welcome back to my career mode let's play slash tutorial series in Kerbal Space Program 1.4.1 with the Making History DLC. In this episode our aim is to get to orbit but we will start off with this suborbital rocket as a basis and we should discuss the difference between suborbital and orbital. Suborbital is going up and then straight back down again as you saw in the previous episode. Orbit as far as Kerbal Space Program is concerned you gotta stay up there indefinitely and that's handy for let's say transferring to other planets or making bases and stuff like that, making stations and basically all the stuff we actually want to do in this game well unless you want to make planes or tanks or there are actually a lot of things that you can do just around Kerbin. If you want to make cars that's fine I do suggest going into sandbox mode for that and not career mode but in any case uh, we want to do stuff staying in orbit, and that means getting into orbit in the first place. And we'll talk about exactly how to do that in a second, but first let's build a rocket capable of it. Right now this is going to be just shy of being able to make orbit, even if we dump the mod propellant. Oh, mod propellant. Mod propellant is fuel that you use for maneuvers, especially docking. And right now we don't have the little thrusters that would enable us to dock, and so it's completely useless right now. So we're going to get rid of it. And, but even after getting rid of it, uh, we really don't have enough delta V for orbit. Delta V is the total amount of velocity that this can impart to the vehicle. Remember, in space, stuff that's moving stays moving. It's not going to be stopped by anything unless it crashes into something. And so the velocity you're going is going to keep being the velocity you're going uh, with a little asterisk that you're in gravitational fields. So, um, well... I'll talk more about gravity and the peculiarities of that once we're underway because you can see it better when it's in action. And sitting in the VAB you really can't see it. But the point is our fuel consumption, our range if you will, is all about how much velocity we impart to our rockets and this just doesn't give us enough velocity to reach orbit. So we're going to need to do either one of two things. Now this is an optimized stage as I said, but it's an optimized stage if you're having a multi-staged rocket. So if we had a decoupler down here and we had another stage, then this is optimized for what it does. But the next stage might not be optimal, right? For instance, if we tried to make another stage, well, if this is the optimized stage, uh, when you think about it, the next stage, the minimum it'll need to have, because this, is, this empty weight is uh, uh, 9.23 tons, well, and then we need double that amount of fuel minimum, so that's 18 tons. Well, that's a total of 27 tons. We just don't have an engine that can lift 27 tons right now. So, or, you know, we could do fancy stuff, though. Uh, if we could attach two engines at the same time, uh, there, 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 there are fancy things you can do, you know, like that. Well, then, then maybe you could make an optimized stage for the next stage. That's starting to cost quite a lot though, and since this stage is already very close to getting us to orbit, it's not necessary to have an entire other stage like that. It's sort of a waste. Besides that, there is also the option of the solid rocket motors. One benefit of the solid rocket motors is just the fact that everything is packed in, it's got the fuel, it's got the, the nozzle, and it's, uh, you know, relatively speaking, low on the mass, whereas this is a little bit heavier all on its own when it doesn't have the fuel. Uh, the other benefit is that it's cheaper. Uh, they are 400, they contain the fuel. This doesn't even have the fuel and it costs 1,200, so it's a lot more expensive. Downside, um, one, they don't gimbal in Kerbal Space Program. In real life, they can but in, uh, in Kerbal Space Program they do not. Not all SRBs in real life gimbal, but some do. Uh, so that's downside. Gimbling, if you recall, is turning the engine to steer the rocket, and that's rather handy. And of course, again, they don't, don't shut down and they don't throttle, so those are downsides too. All in all, rather than uh, adding an SRB, maybe it's better to just add fuel tanks. But, looking at it, I think what we will need is six of these fuel tanks. Really max out the Delta V that this can provide. Not really, actually. Uh, this could go bigger. Right now we're only at 12 tons, 
and it, uh, this engine can carry 16. But at 16, it'll be a really slow liftoff, and I don't think that's the best idea. So we're we're gonna have a we're gonna overburden this one engine, but it's better than carrying two engines. We could, for instance, and you'll see some rockets like this, put another engine here, maybe thrust limit it because we don't need high g-forces at that point, and then add a decoupler. So now we have a two-stage rocket. This stage um, is a little bit underwhelming as far as the delta v. This stage is a little bit underwhelming as far as the delta v, right? Because uh, we were supposed to have an, uh, a stage of 12 tanks, 12 of these tanks, in order to get the best possible stage. This one has 12 tanks, but it's also carrying all of this, so the empty mass is much higher. Um, yeah, so neither of these are particularly optimal. And, and we're also charging ourselves an extra 1,200 for the extra engine. I don't, I don't really want to do that. And also, I didn't add in the cost of the decoupler. So, this is a possible configuration. Or, we could just uh, keep the original stage like we had before. And, this is a possible configuration. Just have this newly unlocked Hammer SRB lift us off. And right now we're 12.8 tons, let's say. And this SRB can lift 19.7 tons. So that'll, that'll be good. I mean, if it gives us enough delta V, that should work. But there's no steering at the start. So either, well, there I say no steering, but the capsule does have that reaction wheel. So we will probably be all okay just pointing straight up. So that's two configurations. See, either the single stage to orbit system, which basically uh, this is a single stage to orbit system. If you've ever heard of that, that's one stage. It'll get us to orbit. Or we use the booster. Well, let's take a look at the cost and just uh, go with that. If we do the single stage to orbit system, 5,160. Let's do both. I mean, I feel like we should experiment. We have the money. This is cheaper. Let's do this first, and then do the other option. And we do want to stage this engine at the same time as we decouple, so that we don't have a little period where we have no thrust. Something you'll notice right away is that the SRBs are almost never like optimal stages. They're not the greatest things ever. Their goal is to get you off the ground quickly, so that you can light the more efficient engine in less atmosphere. Remember. Uh, the efficiency of the engine is related to how much atmosphere is pushing against the thrust coming out. And right at the bottom here, uh, the thrust coming out is facing a lot of resistance from the atmosphere. But if we can get this engine to a higher level, when it starts out, it's going to face less resistance and then get more bang for its buck from each bit of fuel. Okay, so throttle is up, SAS is on, and go. So we can't really steer with this very well so I'm just gonna go straight up for a bit. Maybe we can use the capsule's reaction wheel to turn it somewhat. And you can see me gingerly. The thing is we don't need to go up so much as we need to go horizontal. And I'll show you that in map mode once we dump this. Okay. So you can see me trying to tend towards horizontal. The closer we are to the prograde vector, the better. And through here, I'm going to throttle down a bit. We're facing a lot of resistance because we're going through a transonic region, which is around 300 meters per second to 500 meters per second. You can just assume that you're going to be facing a lot of resistance from the atmosphere around there, a lot of drag, and then we can throttle up again after that. Now you do want to stay close to prograde vector, that's optimal, but in this case because of the SRB it's thrown us off somewhat. Uh, I heard something explode. Okay, I think that was actually the SRB, which I didn't expect to hear explode. Okay, so our apoapsis is developing, and we need to get to 70 kilometers. Uh, we probably want some buffer on that though. Let's say 75. 
Okay, so why do we need horizontal velocity? Why am I turning like this? And really, we should have tried to turn a little bit more decisively quicker, uh, but we couldn't because our SRB didn't steer. Uh, the reason is, well, if you look at it, we only need to go about this much up to get into space. But in order to stay in space, we need to cover all of the ground of Kerbin, which means we need to go this much across, if you will. Uh, so it's that much across, this much up. So it's mostly horizontal. Any, so an orbit is, it can be circular, it can be oval, it can be anything, but any orbit has a very definite energy associated with it, which means a very definite velocity. And the velocity you should be looking at for orbit is 2,300. Uh, at 2,300, you are in orbit around Kerbin, as long as your, uh, your peak, your apoapsis, is above 70 kilometers. So if we take a look at how much delta V, how much more velocity we need right now, we need about 1,500 meters per second more than what we've got right now. And we're hoping that the fuel that we have left is good enough to do that. Now, how much do we have here? Well, we've got about half of our fuel in this stage left. And if you remember, this stage began with 3,200 or so, so we're pretty close. And of course, the, the last part of the fuel gives you more than the first bit because the last bit of fuel isn't lifting the rest of the fuel up with it. So here we go. So we're just going horizontally. You can see I'm flat. And I'm trying to expand my orbit so that we don't fall down again. See, we're still falling down. We're still falling down. And I'm just trying to extend my orbit this way far enough so that we wrap around. And the velocity necessary to do that is roughly 2,300. So that, ap that periapsis, that's the low end of our orbit, but at least we have an orbit right now. Uh, low end of our orbit is still in the atmosphere, but I don't want to continue burning because uh, our peak is far away from us. And the best place to raise your orbit is at your peak. Well, uh, the best place to at, uh, raise your periapsis is at your peak, the bottom part of your orbit. The best place to raise the top part of your orbit is at the bottom part of your orbit. Okay, so we're going to use our reaction wheel right now to turn the craft. You can see the reaction wheel at work. If you didn't have a reaction wheel, you would need the monopropellant and some little thrusters to turn. Otherwise, you won't be able to do that. And we want our periapsis to be above 70, and we're pretty much at our apoapsis, so let's do that. Okay, so 2,237 was good enough for this orbit right here. 2,300 would be for a somewhat lower orbit. You can see we're at 94 kilometers here, and on the opposite side, 72. If we were closer to 7070, then it'll be closer to 2,300. The higher the orbit, the slower it is. So here the moon is only at 542 meters per second. This doesn't mean that it has less energy in that orbit, by the way. It, it's actually easier, f well, we'll get into planetary escapes later, but uh, 542 and then uh, Minmus has 274. So as you can see, the higher the orbit, the less velocity there is until you get to zero in which case you've escaped. But in theory, the gravitational field of Kerbin extends forever. In reality, in Kerbin's, uh, Kerbal Space Program, it doesn't. And that's because we're using patched conics, and there's a point where its gravity is less than the gravity of the sun at that point, and then we go into the sun's sphere of influence. The, sun, uh, the sun's gravity is more important, so the game just calculates that instead. And that's how patched conics works. But we won't need to worry about that for now. We do make sure you have some fuel left over to deorbit, come back down. Otherwise, your Kerbal is going to be stranded and you're going to have to mount a rescue mission. But for now, we're good. Let's do a crew report. Uh, but we've already done the crew report in space, so it's redundant, unfortunately. Um, we did get a credit for making orbit. We've got that pesky parachute contract. I don't even know if we're going to do that this time. But anyway, 
uh, let's try and get back close to the space center. We get our best recovery value out of the craft if we come down close to the space center. So we want to do that. I'm gonna bring my apoapsis down from the periapsis and see what we need to do in order to come back there. So this is roughly opposite as a benchmark from there's this peninsula here and I'm trying to start my retro burn to bring us back down at that peninsula uh, opposite of that peninsula and see at the bottom of our orbit here at the periapsis we're at 2300 so if we were in a circular orbit our velocity would be the same all the way around but because one end of our orbit is higher and one end is lower we're faster on the lower end and slower on the higher end okay and so we point at this marker the retrograde marker or you could select retrograde here and it's not doing a particularly good job of pointing us at that marker. Okay, forget that. Forget I said anything. Um, I think Valentina just leveled up, and so we got this little retrograde option, but she doesn't seem to be doing very well. See? Um, not really. So let's let's not do that. So this is the retrograde marker, and that's the one you want to point at if you want to come back down. But it's important for us to know how far down we're going, otherwise it's going to be rough. So let's bring it down. 26 should be sufficient for most things, but I, I don't want her coming down all the way over here. So I'm going to make it a little bit rougher. I'm going to set to zero and see what happens. This is a bit of an experiment at Valentina's expense. Okay, at this point we can get rid of the stage. We've done all we need to do with it. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. And the reaction wheel on the pod is now very, very strong. Uh, RCS is if you have the little thrusters uh, that use mod propellant. You would press R to engage that if you had those. We'll get those later on. They require special technology. We have encountered the atmosphere. And now it's a matter of slowing down. Now, um, we don't have a heat shield. We have an unlocked heat shields. And the question is, will Valentina survive this particular re-entry? I don't know. Uh, I've seen that it seems to be okay with this pod without a heat shield, but I want to make sure. It probably won't be safe coming back from like the moon to the earth, or sorry, Kerbin, without a heat shield. That's a little bit rougher, and I probably wouldn't put my Kerbal through that. But here, here it might be all right. Now, when you do come back, you want to make sure that it's coasting through the atmosphere for an extended period of time because the atmosphere will help slow it down. If you come down steeply, you're probably going to burn up or cause high g-forces that make your Kerbal faint or something. Uh, but So I've just brought it down so we're going through the atmosphere for, for a fair amount of time so that the atmospheric drag will slow us down gently, if you will. But since you're using the atmospheric drag to slow down gently, that means that re-entry takes a while and you'll be thankful for the physical time warp. So, now in orbit, there is more science to be done with a Kerbal. They can EVA, they can get out of the vehicle and make observations outside of the vehicle. And that can be particularly lucrative as far as science is concerned but we don't have that ability because we have to unlock the astronaut complex to do that. A potential hazard when bringing Kerbals back down are the mountains, especially the mountains to the west of the Kerbal Space Center. So here's the Space Center and here's a mountain range right there. Those, those cause many catastrophes. I think we're gonna land short of them actually. So on the opposite side of the mountains from the space center. You can see the flame effects starting up. Now during re-entry you will get a plasma blackout situation especially with the probes you won't be able to control the pod uh, or whatever vehicle you're bringing back down but when there's a Kerbal in as long as they don't lose consciousness you should be able to control it. So yeah we're well short of the KSC. I brought it down a little bit too steeply bringing it down to a zero periapsis. Uh, probably 20 would have been fine but 
best to avoid the whole mountain range thing. So we're coming down around here in this spot of ocean. And indeed, uh, ablator wasn't necessary. We were able to come back down just with the pod. This is one of the nice things about Kerbin. Of course, it would be impossible to do this around the Earth, but around Earth, the orbital velocity is 7,800. So we're talking about a lot more heat coming back down. Kerbin being small, uh, 10 times smaller than the Earth, and with uh, orbital velocity three times less, uh, well, it's just more convenient in every way. We might actually get to a nice velocity this time to do that contract for the parachute, so let's watch out for that. We will see. Or it could just not slow down. As you can see, it's petering out there. Kerbin's uh, gravity at the surface is the same as Earth's, but its radius is smaller and its overall mass is smaller. The orbital velocity at a particular altitude is dependent on the amount of mass within the circle, basically. Uh, if you've got a circle, circular orbit or any sort of orbit, the question is how much mass is in the middle of it? And Kerbin has much less mass, so that's why the orbital velocity is what it is. If uh, Kerbin had the same mass as Earth... Hold on, let me take a look at this. Uh, okay. Yay, we did that one. Okay, if Kerbin had the same mass as Earth and, and had this size, the orbital velocity would be much higher than that of Earth because it'd have the same mass at a smaller radius and of course smaller orbits are faster. If on the other hand Earth had the mass of Kerbin, the orbital velocity would be way slower. Okay, so that was a nice little orbital flight by Valentina. This time I'll uh, EVA. So you can't uh, pop out in space or even in the air right now because we haven't unlocked the astronaut complex but we can do an EVA report here because we are basically down on the quote-unquote ground so keep the experiment board and we can also do a crew report down here keep okay recover vessel alright so 9.1 science earned uh, 833 funds recovered and Valentina is ready for the next assignment at level 1. We've got a healthy amount of science now. But, uh, you know, uh, just as a test, let's talk about how to optimize your orbital trajectory. Instead of using the SRB, which we have trouble steering, let's go with the extended single stage version of this and see if we can do it that way so that oh did I I might have missed a tank wait one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven oh I meant to have twelve okay so I was short one tank actually anyway we'll go to the 18 tank version this time right so we actually had less fuel than I was supposed to carry and we'll call this beta Y so there's the single stage to orbit one, and the benefit of this is that we can at least steer this engine, and we don't have a second stage, which would cost more. Let's recover that. Uh, no, I want Jeb to go up this time. Okay, well, now SAS is important because we can steer the rocket right from the start, and throttling up is also important because unlike the SRB, we really can uh, throttle this engine, and if we have it at half throttle, we're not going to go up. But okay, other than that, uh, let's go. Now, because we can steer this engine, we want to uh, start tilting fairly soon. Uh, don't overdo it. But basically, this 85 degree mark, I, I hold that until one kilometer. So, I started a little bit soon. Okay, and then after that, we could just follow the prograde marker down. And once your Kerbal is trained up, you can have them hold the prograde marker. I haven't talked about inclination yet, but you've noticed that I've uh, headed out at 90 degrees. The heading here on the nav ball is 90. You see 90? That's important. That means you're heading out at the same uh, as the uh, it, you give get the benefit of the rotation of the planet. Uh, Kerbal is uh, Kerbin is rotating in a certain way, and so you're matching that rotation and getting some benefit from that. 
And you can tell that benefit because the difference between the surface velocity and the orbital velocity, the difference, the gap there is the is the rotation of Kerbin. But I really want it to be exactly 90. I didn't want to be tilted up a little bit like, oh, actually we're tilted a bit south. You can see we're headed a bit south there. So we don't really have a contract for this one. We're just doing this for science. I mean, not really for the that science. I mean, for our our further education as far as trajectories and orbits are concerned. So you see, we're now horizontal, and we would like to eventually get this way quicker. Actually, I would say that uh, at 60 degrees, being between six and nine kilometers in altitude is good. And then by 15 kilometers, being at 45 degrees is pretty good. Uh, maybe being at uh, between 20 and 30 degree pitch here, if you are at uh, 30 kilometers, between 20 and 30 degree pitch at 30 kilometers seems reasonable. But I'm still practicing. I'm very used to playing with a lot of mods, so still need to uh, brush up on all this stuff. So once we're close to our peak we continue the horizontal burn and that's because carbon is small and we don't really need that much time. The engine is powerful. Later on we'll unlock less powerful engines but they'll be worthwhile because they're also lighter. So you can see we're right on the horizon and let's not overdo things. Make sure we get into orbit cleanly. And there we go. Uh, so 84 by 79. Not perfectly circular, but, but good enough. Certainly we are in orbit with plenty of extra fuel. So again, we'll use the same benchmark, uh, this peninsula right here. And opposite of it, we will start retro burning. But this time we will not bring the orbit down so much. And let's see, can Jeb hit retrograde a little bit better? Looks like it. Okay, I guess that system just needed to be warmed up. Okay, and you can right click on these markers in order to keep them up, so I'll do that. This time I'll see what happens when we go 20, but I'm really afraid of the mountains. I'm thinking right now that the mountains might kill us. So we'll see. But you can see we, we still have some fuel there. It's not bad. Let's go back to stability assist instead of retrograde so I can dump off the stage. These engines, not all engines do, do, but these engines do replenish your electric charge while they're running. But it's not good to depend on that because that means you actually have to use fuel in order to restore your electric charge if you're in some sort of a problem. But for these missions around Kerbin orbit, you probably should not need to worry about electric charge that much. Electric charge is mainly consumed by the reaction wheel and hopefully, well, if you find yourself using too much you can, you'll always have the option of tuning down the reaction wheel here especially if it starts to seem very twitchy because uh, you don't, you're not carrying the rest of the rocket around. So I'm gonna do that right now and it'll also consume less electric charge like that. If you did not pick Kerbals level up immediately in the options, of course uh, your Kerbals will not level up immediately. Mine's did, that's why we initially did not have prograde and retrograde here. But because uh, Jeb got more experience having reached orbit, we then got the prograde and retrograde options. And as Jeb levels up more, we'll get more options for uh, Jeb being able to hold certain positions all on his own without us constantly fidgeting around with the spacecraft and that'll be nice. But these are the most important ones. Well that's the alternate space center right there and so you can launch from there and that causes a lot of things to be different. I don't recommend if you're a beginner to be launching from there because it causes some complications as far as reaching the moon in Minmus. We'll get to that. Well, we're landing short of the space center again. Basically in the same location, aren't we? That's interesting. I guess I started my retro burn earlier then. I must have done some extra talking last time. 
Well, we don't have any contracts to fulfill this time. Let's clear our message department there. It's got all the messages. We've got some uh, world's first stuff, which uh, they give you extra bonus uh, funds if you accomplish certain things that even weren't part of official contracts. So, yeah, if you go past the sound barrier and stuff like that, certain heights, you will get bonuses. Currently we have 248,000 funds, so that's pretty good. We, we could start trying to unlock some buildings maybe. Or we could just see what we can get away with without unlocking some other buildings. We should try and get to the moon without unlocking another building. I think that's fair. Once you have the parachute out, you don't need SAS on anymore. The atmosphere will automatically orient you. So I don't know if there's other stuff that I should have covered as far as getting to orbit is concerned, but I think I think we've covered the basics. Obviously, I need to talk about delta v in more detail and how it's calculated and all of that if you really want to design your own rockets more broadly. But actually, in principle, if you just remember the the rule of having double the amount of fuel as dry weight, and you can use that as a benchmark to calculate your delta V, uh, because as long as you have double the fuel as your dry weight, so if the dry weight's three tons, you have six tons of fuel in, um, as long as that's true, you can always multi uh, multiply the ISP by 10, and that's your delta V. So that's a shortcut for that. And the way to calculate the delta V in general and delta V requirements, the delta V in general, you calculate it, and that's the rocket equation, aptly named. And delta V requirements, there are ways to calculate that, but uh, in general, we would like to use other tools to calculate the delta V requirements for certain things like getting into orbit. Uh, 3,500 is pretty good. If you really want to be safe about it in all situations, 4,000, you know, that's including maybe accidentally flipping the rocket. Oh, you can flip a rocket. If you're having that trouble, uh, when you do your uh, turn to make orbit, right, we're turning horizontal. Obviously, if you turn too far away from the prograde vector, you can flip your rocket. Um, well, maybe you should add some more margin for flips if you're not used to making sure the rocket points at that prograde vector that, uh, you know, oh, I didn't really discuss in detail the prograde vector. I've got a lot to talk about, let's face it. So next time I'm going to talk about vectors and many other things. But uh, for now, I hope I, I have talked enough and I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time.